In Plato's Credo, we find the philosopher Socrates in prison. In 399 BCE, Socrates was found guilty of two crimes. First was impiety, or failure to respect the gods. Second was corrupting the youth of Athens. And in this dialogue, Plato dramatizes a conversation between his imprisoned teacher and a friend of Socrates' named Crito, who wants to break him out of prison. The only problem is Socrates won't leave. In one of the greatest works of legal or political philosophy ever written, Socrates, a man who dedicated much of his life to understanding the nature of justice, seems to make the case that we should never break the law, even if those laws seem to be unjust. So Plato's Crito is one of several dialogues that tell the story of Socrates' trial and execution. We find the story of Socrates' trial in Plato's Apology and the story of his death in Plato's Phaedo. So here I'm going to give you a summary of Plato's Crito and also offer up a close reading of the dialogue. I'll focus on the arguments we get from both Crito and Socrates, but a dialogue is a lot like a play and we need to pay attention to the context and the setting of the action to really understand what's going on. For example, consider the very first lines of this dialogue dialogue because they are weird. Socrates wakes up to find Crito sitting in his prison cell with him. Why have you come so early, Crito? Or is it not still early? It certainly is. How early? Early dawn. The reason this is odd is because just a short time later, Crito is going to reveal that he's in a rush. He's there to break Socrates out of prison and they need to go right now because Socrates could be executed at any time. But think about this. If Crito is in such a rush, why doesn't he wake Socrates up? Why is he just sitting around waiting for Socrates to rouse himself? This is a puzzle, and I think the solution to it actually tells us something important about this dialogue, but we'll get to that in a minute. So Crito is here to persuade Socrates to leave, but Socrates won't leave. And the first argument he makes is a little odd, is about majority opinion. Crito claims that the real problem with Socrates dying in prison is that he's going to make his friends look bad. Socrates responds by saying, look, what the majority thinks doesn't matter. The majority can't harm us. Then Crito says that is demonstrably untrue because the majority has sent you here to die. And then Crito goes off. He accuses Socrates of several faults. He says, you are not being just. You are abandoning your children. You are not being courageous. He also tells Socrates not to worry about all those things he said in court, that he shouldn't worry about going back on his word. So what did Socrates say in court? Several things, but in this context, the most important is his comment on exile. Socrates said to the Athenian jury they shouldn't exile him. There would be no point because wherever he went, he would just end up philosophizing again. And then those new people in that new place would want to kill him too. And so he said he'd rather stay in Athens and die than go somewhere else and practice philosophy there. But maybe the main argument that Crito makes, he doubles down on this idea that Socrates' death will make his friends look bad. The fact that your trial came to court when it need not have done so, the handling of the trial itself, and now this absurd ending, which will be thought to have got beyond our control through some cowardice and unmanliness on our part. Socrates responds to all of these arguments, but he starts with the point about majority opinion. Should we respect all opinions or only the opinions of those who know? Only the opinions of those who know. Should we respect everyone's opinion equally or should we show more respect to the opinions of wise people? Wise people know best. So if you're sick, you seek out the opinion of a doctor, not the opinion of just anyone. Obviously, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. Because he has real, he knowledge. Has real knowledge. Socrates then goes on to say, we should not worry about the opinions of the many, but only about the opinions of the wise. He says this matters especially in this case, because what's at stake here is not just the security of Socrates' body, but something much more important, the state of Socrates' soul. If we ruin the health of our bodies by following bad advice, life won't be worth living, will it? No, it won't. And the soul is more important to our happiness than the body is. Yes, Socrates. So if we ruin the health of our souls by caring too much about the advice of the many, then life won't be worth living. So Socrates dismisses Crito's concern for majority opinion, but something else quite dramatic is happening here. Socrates is rehearsing some of his core arguments with one of his friends, just before he dies. One of these characteristic Socratic arguments is that knowledge matters more than opinion. Another is that the soul matters more than the body. In other contexts, Socrates might spend a whole dialogue debating these points, but here he just breezes through them. The reason, it seems, is because Crito is Socrates' friend. He has heard these arguments before. 
He knows these things. Socrates is telling Crito things he already knows. And here, I think it becomes clear why Crito was reluctant to wake the sleeping Socrates. Crito was ashamed. Crito doesn't want to wake Socrates up in his jail cell because he's ashamed. He's ashamed to ask his teacher to break the law. This, I think, is signaled early in the dialogue when Socrates asks, with actions just and unjust, shameful and beautiful, good and bad, about which we are now deliberating, should we follow the opinion of the many and fear it, or that of the one, if there is one who has knowledge of these things, and before whom we feel fear and shame more than before all the others. Socrates, I think, is the one who has knowledge of these things, and Crito is ashamed to ask him to do the wrong thing. But Crito is also human, and he doesn't want his friend and teacher to die. Socrates clarifies the question this way. He says, our only concern is whether it is right or wrong to leave this cell. Hey, I'm in my attic. I sort of thought this would look like a jail cell. Is this working? This is a weird idea. In this part of the dialogue, Socrates adopts a pretty extreme position. Speaking of extreme positions, we get here a Socratic account of justice. Never wrong another person, even if they have wronged you. Never harm another person, even if they have harmed you. And always fulfill your agreements. Keep your promises, never cheat. So Socrates needs to know, if we leave the prison, are we harming anyone? And are we breaking our promises? In response to this question, Crito says, I don't know how to answer you, Socrates. And you can hear the emotion in his voice, I think. So Socrates does this kind of weird thing where he imagines himself in conversation with the laws of Athens. All right, I, I gotta get out of here. No, oh, ah, ah, it is a prison. So the laws say, Socrates, by disobeying us, you intend to destroy us because you affirm that our laws, our verdicts in court should have no force and can be ignored by private individuals. What should we say? The city wronged me and this decision was not right? Yes, by Zeus, Socrates, that is our answer. Now, pay attention because in this section of the dialogue, which is maybe the key section, Socrates advances a provocative argument about the relationship between citizens and the state. In summary, the laws say, here is why you have to obey us. First, you were born here which is not actually just an accident. In fact, the state created the conditions for your parents to marry and have children. So you are indebted to the state for your very existence. Next, you were raised and educated here by the Athenian state and by Athenian culture. Also, you're gonna hate this argument. The state is like your father. And just as there is no equality between you and your parent, there is no equality between you and the state. Just like your parents can ground you and take away your phone, but you can't ground them and take away their phones. In fact, your country ought to be honored more highly than your parents. You have no right of retaliation. If the state decides to destroy you, it can destroy you. You have no right to destroy the state. You must either persuade the state that what it's doing is unjust, or obey. There's actually something very tricky going on in this laws argument, so we have to come back to this later and kind of flip this whole thing on its head and take it apart, but for now, let me just finish up with Crito's objection. The main thread here is that you are indebted to your country. Do you find this persuasive? I think as moderns, and particularly as liberal Democrats, we often perceive government to be by nature intrusive. So this argument is unlikely to persuade people like you and me, but I'm curious what you think. Because the laws here have another trick up their sleeve. Do laws have sleeves? The laws say, you know, Socrates, if you didn't like us, you were free to leave at any time. And this is a pretty strong argument because Socrates, as you may know, famously never left Athens unless he absolutely had to. He did not go on weekend getaways, no road trips. Socrates stayed home. Socrates, we have convincing proofs that we and the city were congenial to you. You would not have dwelt here most consistently of all the Athenians if the city had not been exceedingly pleasing to you. So at this point, I think the core question of the dialogue has actually been revealed. What Crito is asking, really what he's been asking the whole time, is whether or not you're justified in extreme situations to sacrifice your principles in order to save your life. This is where Crito's earlier claim that Socrates need not worry what he said in the court really matters. Because Crito is saying to Socrates, Socrates, you don't have to keep your word. You don't have to stand up for your principles if it's going to cost you your life. And Socrates essentially says, Crito, of course I do. Crito's question about principles versus death 
is really just the most extreme formulation of a problem that Socrates has been wrestling with for his whole career. Socrates is forever encountering people in Athens who say, I'm only going to do what's right if it works out to my advantage. If it's to my advantage to do the wrong thing, I ought to do the wrong thing and not the right thing. Socrates' response to this argument and other dialogues is, is pretty consistent. Doing the wrong thing is never to your advantage. For Socrates, it's always to your advantage to do what's right because your soul matters more than your body and doing the wrong thing does harm to your soul, even if it benefits your body or your material condition. So making money in some unjust way is by definition not advantageous to you. It's actually disadvantageous because it does damage to your soul. It seems that Socrates has said, you ought to obey any unjust law, obey every unjust law, suffer any injustice, and you have no right to oppose the regime even if they're doing something unjust. The strangest thing about this to me is that the state is allowed to make mistakes while the individual is not. So Socrates holds himself to a much higher standard than he holds Athens. Socrates is not allowed to do one unjust thing, but Athens is allowed to kill Socrates. So Socrates seems willing to forgive Athens in a way that he would not be prepared to forgive himself. One possible solution to this is that Socrates would be knowingly doing something wrong where maybe Athens has just made a mistake. Maybe Athens has mistakenly done an unjust thing. In any event, Socrates seems magnanimously to be able to forgive them for it. But the other more important thing is that in this speech by the laws, Socrates has actually laid out criteria by which we can evaluate the justice of a regime. It turns out our obedience is conditional. And the condition of that obedience is that we live in a just state. There are two critical aspects of this that Socrates lays out. The first is that you are free to leave the regime. You're free to leave at any time. The other, and the laws affirm this repeatedly, is that you have opportunities to persuade the laws that they are unjust. So that seems to point to some kind of democratic process or at a minimum, at least not a tyrannical regime. So it's under these specific conditions that you must obey the laws. If you enjoy thinking about political philosophy, I've got a whole playlist on that stuff over here. You can check it out. I'll see you there. Talk to you soon.